Australian in here, and it's time for Real Men. So uh, I hope you have your nachos. I hope you got some non-alcoholic beverages. I mean, whatever your conscience allows is fine with me. Uh, but there are people all over the globe joining us today for Real Men. It's going to be awesome. We're growing like crazy. Um, there's people all the way in other countries watching alongside you guys tonight, as well as churches that are gathering in their buildings watching Real Men with you guys. It's awesome to have so many men across this country, across this world, joining together to grow in their faith and to be encouraged with other brothers in Christ. That's what we're called to do. That's what men in this day and age need to do um, to be good fathers, husbands, and uh, leaders in their community. So thank you for jo joining Real Men today with us. Um, this series is going to be absolutely epic. We are all about healthy masculinity and equipping men. Pastor Mark is passionate about reaching men with the gospel because when the gospel gets involved, everything gets better. We're pro-Jesus, pro-building men up, pro-helping men become better husbands, fathers that bless women and children. If you want to get connected and have all the updates about real men, the best way to do that is text MEN to 99383, MEN to 99383, that's not woman, that's not child, that's not baby, that's not trans, it's MEN to 99383. We'll send you tons of free resources and all kinds of stuff that'll build you up to be a better man. And if you're like my wife and you're a woman watching alongside us, you should comment below because there's actually a surprising amount of women that watch this because they want better husbands and fathers in their life and single women trying to learn what a good man is. So uh, if you want to join us in person uh, and you're a senior pastor, we would love for you to fly out, come to Real Men. Um, we'll host a dinner with Pastor Mark. You can ask all of your questions, learn how Real Men is, learn the secret sauce, and you can replicate it back in whatever state you're from. We've had people from North Carolina, South Carolina, from Texas, from Washington, from California, from Oklahoma. We have guys join us all the time. We gather together at Trinity Church in Scottsdale, Arizona, around tables where we hear an awesome teaching from Pastor Mark, what you're about to hear, and then we build each other up in small groups, um, asking some questions that are sermon-based, and uh, grow together. So it's awesome, guys. And right now, it's sermon time. So get those nachos ready, and get ready to dive into some real protein. joined us it's an honor to have you and for the couple hundred thousand guys online get this started at your church men need to be in church together encouraging one another because our world is a dumpster fire and it is custom tailor built to neuter and castrate good men we're here to fix that we're here to build you up in a world that's trying to break you down amen all right, so um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to yell for a while, and then you're going to pray for a while, all right? That's how we do this. So tonight we're talking in this series of dominion that God is our Father, and he has all dominion. And the first thing to be as a man is under the Father's dominion, and then using the dominion that he gives you in your spheres of influence as a leader, and that's why God made you his son to be a man. And today we're going to talk about your children or your responsibilities. So we're going to talk a little bit about fathers. I want, to think you, I want you to think about your father, your grandfather, and how many of you are dads? You're, you're, how many of you dads, granddads in the house? We want to honor all of you men. Thank you for joining us. And uh, just as a little plug, man, you guys are doing good at making babies. I, you guys, you must not be having a lot of fights with your wife. Man, there's just kids being born. We have 500 kids, fifth grade and under, uh, in kids' ministry every single weekend, and it's growing really, really fast, okay? And so we want, we want the kids to have a dad who loves and serves Jesus and is a, a blessing to them. And so let me tell you a little bit about my background. We all come here from somewhere. My, I had two grandpas, one I didn't really know. He lived out of state. My other grandpa I was very close with, my grandpa George, one of my favorite people. He passed away when I was 10 and I'll never forget that loss in my life. My dad, uh, I was the oldest of five kids. My mom and dad have been married for more than 50 years. I've got a godly great dad. He worked 
very hard, literally uh, broke his back as a construction worker trying to feed five kids. My dad is a hardworking, integrous man. And now he's heavily invested in raising his 20 some grandchildren, uh, five of which are my kids. And so I love my dad and I wanna honor my dad. He's a great man. And now I'm a dad, I've got five kids. I've got uh, three boys, uh, two girls. Uh, the older three are married. The first two that are married each have a child. So I'm now a grandfather to two grandsons. And uh, it's, it's awesome. And I've got a, a college age daughter and my youngest son is a senior in high school. So my sons are here. And also it's really cool tonight. My grandson is here, he's a week and a half old. He's here with his dad, my son-in-law. And so he's the first real little man. And so he's here with us tonight as well. So even just in the room, it's me and my sons and my son-in-law, my grandson, great, great, great night. And, uh, and I'll never forget uh, the first time I became a dad, uh, my wife and I uh, were just really excited. And I thought for sure I was gonna have a son. And my wife wouldn't find out. And so she's like, it'll be a surprise. I'm like, ah, it'll be a son. Because God can't give you, you know, he won't give you more than you can handle. And I know what to do with a boy. A girl, I'm like, I don't know, man. A boy, it's like, here, eat meat, pee outside, give me the knuckles. Like, I know what to do, you know? Girl, you're like, I don't know, man. I'm not good at tea parties and dress up. I got a lot to learn. So out comes our firstborn child. It's a daughter. I thought for sure we're having a son. They're like, it's a girl. I was like, oh boy, I'm, I'm immediately in over my head. And uh, it was, my wife had a C-section because I have like a Shrek size head. And so labor was a little bit complicated and the engineering didn't work out as I was hoping. So she uh, was kind of out of it on meds after the C-section. And so here's my brand new firstborn baby and it's a little girl. And we'd filled out all the forms for what to do with vaccinations and all these things. Cause I don't know, not to get super into it, but we're not really big on a lot of certain medical things. And uh, you know, my wife, anyway, are you an anti-vaxxer? Yeah. So anyways, um, so, um, so then, um, so then uh, the nurse takes the baby, uh, the daughter, and uh, goes to put some cream in her eye. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? My wife's out of it. She's kind of the expert on the medical stuff. And they're like, well, we got to put cream in her eye. I was like, why? They're like, well, in case your wife has a venereal disease. I was like, wait, what? What? <laughs> Hey, my name's Pastor Mark. Uh, that's my wife, not my stripper. Like, I know what's going on here. We're good. We're good. We're good. Like, you know, <laughs> like I met her at 17 and, uh, you know, you don't need to, they're like, then they go to give her a shot and all of her shots. I was like, wait a minute, we filled out the forms. There's certain shots we want, certain ones we don't. I said, what's that? They're like, oh, that's the hepatitis B shot. I was like, hepatitis B? I was like, what? Well, no, we didn't fill out that. No. Uh, no. And they're like, well, you know, we're the medical. I said, no, I'm the father. I have dominion or I have authority. This is my daughter. I have, I, this is my daughter, it's not your kid. You're not gonna raise them, right? I don't even know who you are. So I said, what do they need Hep B for? They said, uh, well, if she grows up to be an intravenous drug user or a prostitute, this will help. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I need a needle. I'm, I'm gonna stick you. Like, that's what I'm gonna do right now. I was like, my daughter just got born. I haven't even held her yet. And you've got her on a pole. And you know, <sighs> you'll get that on the way home. Some of your homeschool, ask the guys from public school. Uh, so, huh? Yeah, I was like, she just got born and you've got her as a drug user and a, and a prostitute. I said, she doesn't need the shot. The, the gal asked, she's like, why? I said, cause I'm her dad. Like, I, I promise you, she, she doesn't need to worry about getting a hep B shot cause she's not gonna be a drug user and she's not gonna be a prostitute. She's gonna be my daughter and I'm gonna do my job. You know, it's, just, it's just this crazy world where people show up and they're like, hey, we know what's best for your kid. And for me, it started like minute one. My kid just showed up and somebody's trying to exercise dominion and make a decision that literally affects the remainder of their life. And what I'm telling you is this, that as men, God has given you authority for your children. And you can't just delegate it to government. You can't delegate it to the school system. You can't delegate it to the medical establishment. You can't delegate it to the social media platforms. You need to exercise your God-given authority to bless and to protect your children so that they can grow up in the healthiest possible environment. And nobody ever tells you that. Just like, well, send your kid to the public school and let them be brainwashed and then send them to the doctor and let them stick with them with whatever they want and then just hand them a device and let the algorithm decide who's going to parent them and what they're going to watch. And the answer is, no, 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 no. We are the fathers and we are the father's sons. And the father has sent us here to be their father. 
And this hit me uh, when my daughter was uh, little. And again, uh, it's crazy because now her son is in the room, uh, which is just unbelievable. And I was tucking her in bed and I was wrapping her up like a burrito. And so um, this was our deal. She'd like me to tuck her in. She liked the cover super tight. We'd pray together and sing together and read the Bible together and snuggle with her and get that kind of bedtime daddy time. And she looked at me and she, uh, she said, I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so lucky. I was like, why honey? She's like, I have two daddies. And I was like, did your mom not tell me something? Like, you know, like, you know, like, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen this on the Jerry Springer show. This does happen. I hope I'm not an episode. I was like, what do you mean, sweetie pie? She's like, I have a daddy in heaven and I have a daddy on earth and they both love me. And it dawned on me. I was like, oh my gosh, father, father. The father has shared his title with me. And so the way I treat her is going to tell her a lot about him. Because if we have the same title, if I love her, then she'll know that he loves her. And if I'm not good to her, then she'll worry what kind of father in heaven she has. So I wanna talk a lot about being a father. For some of you, this is gonna trigger what I call a father wound and you're gonna think about your dad. You may need to deal with some forgiveness and some healing so that you can be a healthy version of yourself. For some of you, it'll give you gratitude for your father, but ultimately I want it to spin to this. For those of us who are fathers or grandfathers, I want us to think about how we can be a better father or grandfather. And for you single guys that are hoping to get married and be fathers, praise God, you're a statistical minority and a miracle. If you're heterosexual, wanna get married and have children in that order, please do. But we wanna talk a little bit about fatherhood before we get there. I'm just gonna deal with two scriptures and then we're gonna go deep. But Proverbs 3.12 says this, the Lord disciplines, so this is our heavenly father, those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Let me just start with this. Fathering is delighting and disciplining, okay? Delighting and disciplining. Delighting should be what you do most of the time. Delighting, having fun, making memories, being generous, having good times, right? How many of you, like me, like, I really love being a dad. I love it. I like being a dad. I like having my kids, and now they're growing up, and every season is different, but good in a different way. But even raising my sons, I'm like, I'm so glad I get to be your dad. Let's wrestle. Let's play wiffle ball. When my girls were little, I'd be like, hey, what do you want to do for a daddy date? And we get dressed up. We go out to dinner or tea or coffee. My boys, it was always like, what do you guys want to do? We want to go to the dump. So we had this old truck called Chuck the Truck. It was an old C10 and it had a slider window. And uh, we would fill it up with garbage and go to the dump. And all the boys ever wanted to do, they just wanted to throw things out of the truck and break them. That's all they wanted to do. And it was like, man, we really felt connected at the heart level. The girls never wanted to do dump day with dad, but that's what the boys want to do. And then they always wanted to go out then and uh, go to a barbecue shop. And I remember thinking like, I'm breaking stuff and eating brisket with my sons. Like, I'm a blessed man. This is a great life, you know? And, and, and being a dad is awesome. It's all these great memories and great opportunities. And, and to me, it's a ton of fun. And so what the Bible says is you delight in your child. You make memories, you have fun, you enjoy them. And then when they deviate, you discipline them so that what? So that you can go back to enjoying them. Disciplining the child is not just about getting them to obey, but getting them to be the kind of child that you enjoy the relationship with them. And the two of you can get back to making memories and having fun and doing good things. See the difference? Too many dads are just disciplining, trying to get you to be obedient, but they still don't invest and enjoy you. So the goal as a dad is, I wanna enjoy this relationship. And when you're sinning, I need to correct you so that we can get back to what? Enjoying you. I want this to be fun and make memories. And I don't wanna discipline you all the time. And I don't want you to be acting up. I want us to have fun together, make memories together, enjoy life together. And when you deviate from that, I'm gonna bring you back to joy. That's the point of fathering. And so how do you do this? Well, you gotta raise your child. Here, here we go. Here's our text, Ephesians 6, one through four, children, Obey your parents, mom and dad, because every child is like a military strategist. They have learned to divide and conquer. Like a little child is just a military general in a diaper. They have figured if I can get mom and dad to turn on each other, then I can rule the family. So mom and dad need to present a united front. We talked about this last talk in Dominion regarding marriage and how you and your wife need to be aligned. And then the child needs to honor and obey their mother in the law and their father, uh, parents in the Lord. So the goal is to raise your child in the Lord, right? And somebody like, I don't wanna influence my child. I don't wanna pick their path. I don't wanna tell them what religion, like I do, because they don't know anything. 
And I do. I know that the Bible is true, that Jesus saves, and the Holy Spirit changes your life. And I want to deeply, profoundly influence my child because I want to raise them in the Lord. And if I don't raise them in the Lord, then I'm raising them in the world. And right now in the world, we're castrating our sons. We are causing them to be addicted. There's over-mothering, under-fathering, failure to launch, uh, we've legalized drugs, we've handed out porn, we've created mental illness and brokenness. 40% of millennials don't even wanna be married and guys are fearful of even being a father. So you know what? The world in its wisdom does not know God and has no right to raise my son. Just, just a thought. So anyways. Um, Honor your father and mother. He says, this is the first commandment that comes with the promise. This is one of the 10 commandments that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So that's the instruction to children. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Paul says the same thing in Colossians, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so what he says here is this, if you have good parents, you live a longer life. How many of you have seen parents that didn't discipline and raise and cultivate their children and their life got cut short? Statistically, if you don't have a dad, you die younger and you live in poverty and addiction on your way to an early grave. And so what he's talking about here is good parents launch the next generation so that you can have a legacy. And, and what we think about here as men is not just our life, but our legacy. I want my sons to stand on my shoulders and do, do more and better than me. I, I want my life to be their floor, not their ceiling. And then I want my grandsons to stand on their shoulders. And I want each generation to get healthier and stronger, uh, to get more in love with Jesus and to get more economically established. I want there to be progress. And what he says is that doesn't happen without parenting. And so he gives two things. Uh, do not provoke, but do train. So let me talk about this. So um, how many of you, don't raise your hand, but your dad provoked you. He, his primary ability was to discourage you, to trigger you, to frustrate you, to disappoint you, um, to anger you. What he says is, dad, don't do that. Here's some ways that fathers provoke anger in their children. I'll just give you some practical. Make more withdrawals through criticisms than deposits through encouragements. In your relationship with your child, especially as your child get older, every encouragement is a deposit. It's like a bank account. But every criticism or correction is a withdrawal. As a father, are you going to need to make some withdrawals? Yeah, because your kid's a sinner and you're gonna have to talk about those things like, you should, that was wrong, we gotta talk about that. Let me correct here. It's gonna feel like criticism, but it's correction. But how many of you, again, don't raise your hand, but your dad, he made a lot of withdrawals. He didn't make any deposits. He never said, I'm proud of you, good job, I love you, I'm here for you. You know, you're making progress, keep going, be encouraged. Some fathers, all they ever do is make withdrawals, they don't make deposits, and that provokes the child to anger. It's like the only time I hear from you is when you have something bad to say regarding me. Physically, this is another way that a father can provoke a child. True or false, dad's bigger and stronger, he just is. So dad can raise his voice. Dad can be domineering, overbearing. Dad can discipline out of anger. Let me say this, never discipline out of anger because the point of discipline is not to punish them, but to correct them. So it's done in love to bring them back into the place where you enjoy the relationship. Some of you, your dads, they were just, they were a bully. They would hit you. They would discipline you in anger. They were domineering, overbearing. They were physically intimidating. They'd just pick you up. They'd shove you down. They would raise their voice. They would tower over you. And what this does, it does one of two things to a little boy. It either breaks him or it causes him to grow up and to be more violent and more angry than his father so he can defeat him. And what you don't want is a broken son or a bad son. And so just a few things. Um, when you feel your children causing you to escalate in anger or frustration, true or false, your children will do this. Some of you, your kid, it's like they've got a master's degree in hitting your buttons. If you have multiple kids, there's gonna be one kid that's like, I got them, I got them, I got them. They just know how to get you. Okay? And when that happens, you've gotta sometimes not just give them a timeout, you gotta take a timeout. Like, you know what? Dad's gotta go talk to his father 
before I talk to my kid. And I gotta go work this out with my father before I work it out with my kid. You're always a son. And the best way to be a father is to be a good son. And what I used to do with my kids when I would correct them, I'll show you, I'm an old catcher. So what I would do, because dad's big and dad can be intimidating and overbearing. So um, what I would do when I discipline my kids or correct them or we had to talk about something, I literally would squat, I'm, I'm an old catcher, and I would just look them in the eye. I wanted to literally get on their level. You know why? It's not domineering or overbearing. I start with a smile. And I'd say, I'd call my son's little buddy. Hey, little buddy, when you talk about something, okay, dad. And it, uh, sometimes my sons, I could see that they were agitated or they were angry, they were frustrated. I put a hand on them. Put a hand on them. Hey, I'm your dad. I love you. I'm here. Calm down. And sometimes if they were really worked up, I pray over them. Hey, come here. And I put a hand on their head. Let me pray for you. Let's get the Holy Spirit in here. You know, you're a little freaked out. Maybe dad's a little upset. Let's, let's just calm this thing down here. And then we'd have, and I'd watch my tone, not raise my voice. And I tried to look them in the eye. Hey, little buddy, I love you. Can we, we can talk about something. Dad, I'm frustrated. Okay, I know. Here, let me, let me, here, come here. I'm your dad. Just try and comfort because you need to connect before you correct. Because what I, what I knew was this. One day, that son that was going to be looking me in the eye. And on that day, I didn't want him to think, okay, now finally I can take my dad. I want him to know I, I love you and I'm for you. And, and I'm going to be looking you in the eye when you're little. And you're going to be looking me in the eye when you're big. And let me say this, when you've got a little boy, you don't think this, but someday he's gonna be able to take you. And if your whole relationship is the strongest one dominates the other, you're just raising that son to grow up and to be a very violent man and never to have a really loving and healthy relationship. I've got strong sons. I love them with all my heart. I still tell them I love them all the time. They tell me they love me and you know, I pat them on the shoulder. But I mean, my sons now all look down at me. Okay? And I'm not saying they could take me, but I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying that the day is coming when they think that's a possibility. Okay, so um, <clears throat> here's a couple other ways you could frustrate your kids. Correction without instruction. There are certain parents, they correct their child, but they don't instruct their child. So the child doesn't even know what they did. All right? how many of you have seen a kid, parent comes up, just disciplines them, which is in anger and isn't right. And here's what I used to do too, and I'd correct, I'll just talk about my sons. Um, when I'd look at my sons, I'd say, hey, buddy, you got two options, okay? Two options. You can obey dad, or I'm gonna have to discipline you, and then you're gonna obey dad. Those are the two options. Notice one option was, I, this was never an option. You don't have to obey your dad. Now, I had five kids. I had one kid. I was like, I'll take the discipline. It was that kid. I was like, no, just to be clear, you're right, like, uh, you're gonna do what I say, and you can do it with or without correction. He's like, I'm gonna need the correction. Okay, um, <laughs> he's doing great now, uh, wore his mom out, but you know, he's doing good now. But within that, um, sometimes when you discipline a child, you're like, you, you're angry at them or you discipline them and they don't know what they did. I'll never forget, I was at a grocery store. There was this kid, he was doing, I don't know what he did. Mom just walked up and spanked him. And the kid's like, what did I do? And she just walked away. And the kid's totally discouraged because he's like, I got disciplined, I don't even know what I did. So here's the big idea. Instruction precedes correction. Otherwise, you're going to anger your child. And, and if it's something you're like, actually, I've never actually taught them that, then don't discipline them, instruct them. You know what? I haven't told you about this. Okay, let me, let me explain this. You're, you're not allowed to do that. If I made myself clear, okay. So if that happens again, there's gonna be a consequence. But now I have told you, repeat back to me, what did dad just say, right? How about this one? Um, Verbally, your dad discourages by yelling, name calling, cursing, or barking. Um, in some families, dad just turns up the volume, gets very intense. You're like, if you're a kid, you're like, okay, I, 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 I'm, even if I think he's wrong, I, I'm out. And name calling. You should only give positive, life giving, blessing, naming to your wife and kids. You shouldn't, because a curse is putting a negative name on them. So sometimes with dad, you're like, oh, you're the stupid one. You're the pretty one. Uh, you know, you're, you're the failure. You're the disappointment. You're like, don't, don't, don't put those curses over your kids. Bless them. Bless them. And so my wife, I call her beauty. 
I have nicknames for all my kids. And, uh, and I always called him Buddy Calvin, Buddy Zach. And then the little guy was Good Guy Gid. And Gideon, the baby, he had all the nicknames. I don't know why that is in the family. The baby gets all the nicknames. But if you're gonna give names and nicknames, make them positive, make them life-giving. Um, as well, publicly humiliating. Sometimes what a dad will do to discourage a child is they will address something in public that should have been dealt with in private. Like, dad, why'd you bring that up, you know, at school? Why'd you bring that up at, you know, football, baseball, soccer practice? Dad, why'd you bring that up at the dining room table? You know, you know hey, tell me what the bed last night. He's 12. I thought he outgrew that. Like, dad, why is there, dad, this is a private, not a public. And what you're doing now is you're dishonoring and disrespecting and that causes anger. Because I'll tell you what, the Bible says that in marriage, the key for a wife is to understand that the love language of her husband is respect. And I'll tell you this, a little guy, he has the same love language. He's a man, he's a little man, but he, he grows in an atmosphere of respect. And if there's disrespect, it angers and frustrates him. Um, here's another one that frustrates the kids, not distinguishing the difference between sins and mistakes. Okay, if, What's the difference between a sin and a mistake? A sin is you broke God's law. A mistake is you did something wrong, but it's not in the Bible, okay? And here's, this will be very difficult for you religious parents. You religious parents don't distinguish between sins and mistakes and you discipline your kids for mistakes. And the reason you discipline your kids for, your, for mistakes is because they're annoying and frustrating. But just because you're annoyed and frustrated doesn't mean they've sinned. So I'll give you an example. Years ago, we were at Red Robin and um, we're sitting there with our kids and we go to Red Robin because we're broke and all you can eat fries with five kids. You're like, we're gonna win. You know, we're gonna win this economic deal here. So we're sitting at Red Robin and uh, next to us was a table with, you know, a number of kids and a mom and a dad, but dad was on his phone ignoring his children. He wasn't present. He didn't practice the ministry of presence. And sometimes dad just being there and being intentional is a massive contribution to the well-being of the family. So he's on the phone and the kids order their drinks and he doesn't realize that the waitress is very young. She's obviously not a mother. She brings all the, like the Dr. Peppers um, in large glasses that have ice and are sweating and there's no lid on them. Okay. How many of you are dads, you know, a three-year-old with an extra large Dr. Pepper and no lid, that is inevitable. What's gonna happen, right? So what do you think happens? The kid goes to pick it up slips out, gets Dr. Pepper all over dad, dad freaks out, disciplines the kid. My kids looked at me, they're like, that was a mistake, not a sin. I said, yeah, you're right. My, my one son, who's pretty observant, he said, uh, he said, if he's gonna spank somebody, he should spank himself because he didn't get his kids cups with the lids on them. I was like, yeah, it's, it's a good discipleship point for dad right there. So in that moment, if a kid's got little hands and they're picking up a wet glass and it spills, is that a sin? No, that's a mistake. But dad also made a mistake, not paying attention and getting a cup with a lid on it. So in our house, my kids, my kids got pretty good at this. They'd be like, that was a mistake. So they pull that card out all the time. And sometimes even when they did, say like hit your brother, like, oh, that was a mistake. No, it was not, okay. Uh, so, but I tried to differentiate sins and mistakes because if you discipline a child for a mistake, you're disciplining them for being human. And it's not a sin to be human and human beings make mistakes. Sometimes your kids, they're gonna spill their milk. Yeah, they're gonna... They're gonna drop their dinner. They're gonna break a dish when they were doing the dishes. And it's a mistake, not a sin. Even if it's frustrating, you don't discipline them for that. Maybe you teach them. Hey, next time, don't throw the plate in the sink like a Frisbee. Um, just a little discipleship point. Um, but here's what religious parents do. They hammer on everything. And, and the kid doesn't understand the difference between adultery and putting the lid down because everything is dialed up to a volume of 10. It's like, no, 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 some things are just mistakes. Uh, a couple others, uh, favoritism. If you read the book of Genesis, one of the worst things a parent and a father can do is play favorites. You can't have any favorites unless you have one child, then you can have a favorite. But as soon as you get more than one child, you cannot have a favorite. 
And they're in a family. There's some people like, well, yeah, that was dad's favorite and I was mom's favorite. That's a broken dysfunctional family system. Other times it's like, well, I, I do things for that child that I won't do for that child because I really favor that child. And this can be even more complicated in a blended family. And if you're in a blended family, it's like, okay, how do I not do you know, socialistic equality, but love all the children, serve all the children and not play favorites? And this leads to generational brokenness. This leads to sibling rivalry. This leads to dividing mom and dad. Any sort of favoritism that you have or you tolerate with your wife, it absolutely breaks the discipleship process in the child. Just a couple others as well. Um, not listening. And I always like to say this, um, in a family, you gotta figure out who gets a view, who gets a voice and who gets a vote. There was a lot of things age appropriate with the kids. We call a family meeting, but here's what we're doing. Here's where we're going, here's what's going on. But my, what I've always tried to give my kids is a voice. Even at a very young age, I would ask them, what do you think? You know, what do you guys wanna do for dinner? What do you guys wanna do for vacation? What are you guys thinking about school? What are you thinking about sports? I wanted them to verbalize. Because two things, number one, I wanted to hear what was in their heart. And number two, I wanted them to know that they could always talk to their dad. Now as their dad, I, I rarely gave them the vote. So I'd give them a view, here's what we talk about. Voice, I want you to share with me what you're thinking. Vote, yeah, sometimes I would let kids vote, but other times it's like, no, you're, we wanna hear what, about school. Like when we moved to Arizona, it's like, okay, you gotta go to school. You tell us, each child, what do you want in a school? Here's what our kids said. We wanna go to a medium sky school, not a giant school, okay. We wanna go to a Christian school, not a public school, okay. Um, we wanna go to a school um, where we can play sports, um, okay. And you know what? They got a voice. And so I was like, you know what? Those are all reasonable requests. And so, yeah, you, your dad is gonna make that happen. Too often times what happens is, as a parent, we think I need to tell the children what to do and when they're little, they do, but as they get bigger, you've got to ask them what they want to do. And if they have a bad idea, guess what that is? That's a teachable moment, okay? Oh, actually, you want to go do that? Well, actually, let me explain that. That's not probably a good idea. Let me coach you here. And what happens is if all you ever do is tell your children what to do and you never listen, two things. Number one, they're never going to be leaders. They're only going to be followers because they don't know how to have their own opinions and speak. They only do what they're told. Number two, they're not going to grow in wisdom because you're not having an opportunity to coach them. You're just commanding them. My job as a dad, my hope as a dad was to raise leaders, not followers, who had a voice, were not silent, were active, not passive. And so at a young age, I want to encourage that. A couple other things as well. Parents can get frustrated when dad's just absent. Dad's not home. Dad's, you know, sometimes dad's got too many hobbies. Quite frankly, there's nothing sinful about hobbies. It's like, yeah, dad's out with the guys this night and dad's got season tickets for that and dad's got a man cave and dad's at the golf course and dad doesn't have time. When your kids are little, let me say this to dads. When your kids are little, they're kind of in your world. As they get bigger, you've got to get into their world. Now they got school. Hey, what's going on at school? Who's your friends? What's going on? Now they got sports. Okay, I got to go to their practice and their game. Now they got friends and they're going to a birthday party or maybe eventually a sleepover at a safe environment. And now all of a sudden, they're no longer orbiting around you. You've got to enter into their world. And if you're used to being the absent dad, you're going to miss all of those formative years. A couple other things that frustrate a child as well. Unreasonable performance expectations. Some of you had dads that were like, they were like military drill sergeants and every day was like a performance review and it was like living with an overbearing college wrestling coach, but you were four, so it was a little much. And it's always, you need to produce, you need to perform. You know, you, you, need, to, you need to get these grades and you need to get this, you know, batting average and, and your free throw percentage needs to be, and just so much pressure to perform. And what happens with those kids, usually at some point they fail or they get injured and they feel completely dejected and rejected because their acceptance is only predicated on their performance. That's not a grace-based parenting relationship. That's a works-based parenting relationship. A couple others, um, non-generous. Some dads are really stingy and it's good. Sometimes you need to spend money to make a memory. Yeah, you gotta spend money to make a memory. 
like, hey, let's go to the Diamondbacks game. Hey, let's go out to dinner. Who wants ice cream? I'm gonna buy a tent. We're gonna go camping. And sometimes dad will be like, I don't wanna waste the money. You're not, you're investing the money in the memory. You're investing the money in the memory. And I'm, I'm, I'm off my notes for like, I was doing it this week. My son is a senior, so we're having to put together his senior page for his, his yearbook. So now my wife and I were up late last night going through all the photos. I'm the dad that has tens of thousands of photos on his laptop. I had to get an external hard drive to just handle all the photos and videos. And I have videos of everything. And so I always, hey, what day, here's my thing. Hey, what day is it? First day of school. You know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third. What day is it? Last day of school. What day is it? My wedding day. What day is it? My baptism day. What day is it? My child was born. I want everything recorded. You know why? Because I live for those memories. And those kids are gonna grow up and they're not gonna remember all those memories, but guess what I can do? I can share the memories. Hey, vacation, dinner, fun, game, we spent money to make memories and dad captured those. And one of the most amazingly wonderful things that's ever happened at our home. Recently, the kids with their spouses and then one was engaged fiance, we sat on the couch and I just thought, what would happen if I pulled up all the old memories? We threw them on the TV. Them screwing around as kids and all the weird videos and the crazy photos and dress up days. And we just laughed until we kind of felt a little sick to our stomach. And here's what I'm glad. I'm glad that I spent the money to make the memory. And if you capture the memory, you can actually share it someday with their spouse and then their kids, your grandkids. And sometimes men are cheap and they think they're wasting money when they should be investing the money in the memory. One more, um, dad will frustrate the kids if he never repents of his own sin. How many of you, your dad, your dad never said I'm wrong. I'm sorry, that was my fault. I ask your forgiveness. It's impossible to raise Christian children with an unrepentant father. The essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ is you need to repent to be saved. And if what you do is demand that your children repent and you don't, then you are a hypocrite and a bad example. And what you're teaching them is you repent until you're a parent and then you stop. True or false, if you repent to your kids, it's a little easier for them to come clean with you. I mean, if, you're, if your dad is never wrong and never says sorry, and you do something wrong, you're probably not gonna own it. He's gonna need to catch you, which is how you get the sneaky kids. My kids know before I got saved, I was sleeping with their mom. I was a non-Christian. I fought a lot. I mean, they know my past. I'm not hiding it from them, you know? And then there would be times that I would just need to apologize to the kids. Like, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I jumped to a conclusion. I should have asked more questions. I got frustrated. I took out my hard day on you. I'm sorry, my, your mom and I shouldn't have had that disagreement in front of you. We should have taken that in the other room. And if you'll just own some stuff with your kids, here's what happens. It opens up an honest environment in your home where if something happens, you can raise your hand and say, I screwed up and not get pounded like a nail. But if dad doesn't repent, guess what? Ain't nobody gonna repent. Train your kids. Let me share some things. You are the most powerful spiritual influence on your child. You are the most powerful. Statistically, if dad goes to church, the kids go to church. If dad prays, the kids pray. If dad reads the Bible, the kids read the Bible. If dad raises his hand in worship, the kids raise their hand in worship. If mom tries to take the kids to church and dad doesn't go, he is the stronger gravitational force. Those children statistically will not walk with Jesus. They will still follow their father. And if he's not walking with Jesus, they will not be walking with him either. And so what you wanna create, he says, don't provoke your children to anger, but do bring them up in the Lord. And the original Greek here, not to get super nerdy, it's pedeia, which means the full development of the mind and the body and the soul and the character of a human being. And so um, what he's talking about here is the father is firstly responsible for the well-being of the child. You can delegate your authority, but you can't abdicate it. So you need to decide, okay, where are our children gonna live? What are they gonna eat? 
What are we gonna do with their devices and technology? What education are they going to have? What church will they attend? What families will they be welcome to see? Will those families extend our values or contradict our values? Are we gonna let our kids go to somebody's house for a play date or an overnight? And is that a safe environment or could we have an abusive situation on our hands and some trauma? And as a father, you have authority. When he says, fathers, don't frustrate and anger your child, do evangelize and disciple your child. What he's saying is this, there's one person who's at the front of the line who's responsible for God. Who is that? That's you, that's you. So you need to know what's going on at your kid's school. More than ever, if you just drop your kids off at school, it's probably a very bad idea. And any good school wants you involved. If you're a dad, you're like, I'm an involved dad. Can I get involved here? If it's a good school, they're gonna be so glad to see you. If it's a bad school, they're not gonna wanna see you. Don't just assume that the curriculum is what you would want. When it comes to medical decisions and dating decisions, can your child date? When can they date? When do they get a phone? What happens with the technology at night? All of these issues, I'm just telling you men, the entire world that we live in has just encouraged men to be passive. Just say, you know what? We'll let the government feed and house the kids and let the women raise the sons and let the platforms decide what they watch and let the educational system determine their curriculum. And God's like, no, that's the father's responsibility, amen? I want you men to take your authority and your dominion back. You don't need to be bullies about it. You don't need to be mean about it, but you need to take it very, very seriously. That's your son. That's your daughter. That's your grandson. That's your granddaughter. That's your future. That's your legacy. This is your opportunity. And if you're missing, no one can replace you. No one can replace you. Let me hit a few things in closing. I'm out of time. Um, Let me just jump down to this. Um, 10 facts about fatherhood, if you would. I'm gonna skip a lot. Um, Let me hit number seven. A child cannot raise themselves. (laughs) There was stupid psychological training in the 1970s from a guy named Dr. Spock, who was an unbeliever. He said that we're basically good. We're born morally neutral. And the best thing you can do for a child is they, because they're good, they will just naturally develop into a fully functioning and healthy human being. The one thing you need to give them is positive self-esteem. And so what you have is a whole generation of idiots who feel good about it. That's where we are. Um, And so you just need to know children don't raise themselves. Think of it like gardening. How much work is it to grow a weed? It's really easy. How about a garden? It's constant attention. Children are like gardening. And if you don't tend to them, all you're gonna get is weeds. You're not gonna get a garden. Children, they start with a sin nature and no theology and the absence of the Holy Spirit. What that means is they have nothing except for that which is given to them And if the wrong things are given to them, it's going to poison and destroy them. And so what you wanna give them is love. You wanna give them grace. You wanna give them an environment of Bible teaching and prayer, worship of Jesus, and setting a spiritual tonality in the home. Children won't raise themselves. And let me say this, institutions cannot raise children. If we've learned anything, it's that mothers and fathers are custom built by God to raise children. And I'll just just say this too, I'm way off my notes, but maybe it's helpful. There reaches a point when the children are little, are they primarily about their mother or father? Their mother, she birthed them, they have a biological connection, she has a food source, dad's like, I'll pray for you. You you know, you hold your child and you love your child, but you're not the mother. There reaches a point where the father has to become more active, especially with the sons. Statistically, masculine traits, I won't share all the sociological data, is learned from fathers. So when our boys, Grace and I were talking about last night, there was a certain point where the boys are getting bigger, their voice is dropping, they're kind of entering into puberty and uh, they don't wanna really listen to their mom. Their mom would get a little frustrated with them. So their mom would have the mistake of acting like a big sister. She would argue with them. 
And I would come home and it felt like my son somehow triggered my wife to become the big sister. She got out of the mom slot and I walk in, I'm like, ah, oh boy. Okay, and then you're, okay, I know this isn't your house and this never happened, but if it does, here's what it feels like. Your wife looks at you and she's like, get that boy. And your boy looks at you, he's like, I took mom. And you're kind of feeling proud of both of them, you know, because <laughs> mom's trying, but he's winning. If I'm totally honest with you, you know, you're feeling good for both. So I would look at my wife and I'd be like, okay, now wait a minute, let me take care of him. And, and I, I remember at one point with each of our sons, I, I looked at my wife, I said, I love you. You've been an amazing mom. You've done a great job. At this point, you're going over to the passenger seat. Dad is driving. With one of the boys, she's like, is he yours now? <laughs> well, I'm not, you know, you're not surrendering full custody. You will be involved. I said, but yeah, he's mine now. And I looked at him, I said, son, it's me and you. I'm raising you, buddy. Okay, we're together in this. There has to come a point when a boy is adopted by a father or a spiritual father and helps walk him into manhood. And those, those are vital moments in a son's life. Most men today, their problem is overmothered, underfathered. Still in their 20s and 30s, living at home with their mother being overmothered and underfathered. A mother's instinct is to protect and to nourish and to keep him from harm's way, which is exactly what he needs when he's a baby. But when he becomes a grown man, he needs a father to say, you know what? Life is about risk and responsibility. Go get a job or you will be hungry. Get off the payroll, take responsibility for yourself. It's time to man up, it's time to grow up and don't run to your mother. And there's something in a young man that longs for that. There's something in a young man that says, yes, now I'm with my father and my father is teaching me how to be a man so that one day I can be a father. I will close with this. And uh, there's just so many things. I just wish I could do like a 50 hour lecture on being a dad. Let me give you one more and then another more. Okay, just two more, okay? Um, here's another thought. You don't raise children. You don't raise children. You raise sons and daughters. And sons and daughters are different. They're wonderful, but they're different. We have this androgynous parenting that we raise all children the same. Boys and girls are different. Girls develop verbally, so they wanna talk. Boys develop physically, so they wanna wrestle. Girls can sit in a classroom in a group environment and boys wanna go outside and be active. Our entire educational system is custom built for girls to succeed and boys to be medicated so that then their testosterone levels go down and they're docile like girls. And we live in a day when it's like, well, I don't know, you, how do you raise children? You don't, you raise sons and daughters. They're biologically different, they're sociologically different, they are emotionally different, they are hormonally different, they're just different. I love my sons and my daughters, but they're different. And your goal in raising, so let me ask you this, um, this is a weird talk, right? It's kind of a little, this is like, uh, this, it feels like peanut butter and sushi. We got a little bit of everything here. I'm not sure it's all going together. Um, so do you want to raise your sons to be grown independent men? Okay. Do you want to raise your daughters to be grown independent women? No. Unless you want her to be single or divorced. She's supposed to be a helper and she's supposed to be one with her husband. It says in the Bible um, that a, a son takes a wife. He leaves his mother and father and takes a wife. It says that a daughter is given in marriage. You know what that means? Her dad's still involved. My goal with my daughters was to make them strong, but not independent. What's the difference? Well, an independent woman is not fit to be a wife. Probably just got kicked off the internet. <laughs> but a fiercely independent woman is not fit to be a wife. That's why they're single and divorced or marrying guys that are less than that they can then mother. Okay? My goal with my daughters was not to make them independent, but strong. My daughters, very strong. My wife, very strong. Strength is not a problem, independence is. 
I need my sons to be independent. Go pay your own bills, buy a house, graduate, make a plan, stay sober, pay your bills, figure it out, read your Bible, walk with God, be a grown man, and then go find a girl. But if you go find a girl that's so independent that she doesn't want you or need you, you're not going to have a marriage because you'll never be one. So the goal with daughters is to raise them to be strong, but not independent. The goal with sons is to raise them to be strong and dependent. The kind of guy that got rather independent so that if he's independent, guess what she can? She can depend on him. And the reason that a whole generation of women are missing marriage and motherhood is they're independent and they can't depend on any guy. It's because we haven't raised our sons to be independent. But we've raised our daughters to be independent. Um, give you one more, I'm over time. Um, we need more fathers, less government. I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, the older I get, the less I like the government. Just, I'll just tell you. So, some of you guys are young and you're like, I don't know, I kind of like the government. It's because you're taking my money. That's why you like the government. <laughs> you don't work and I do. Um, the America First Policy Institute on Fatherlessness. The America First Policy Institute on Fatherlessness. Read this. One in four children, 18 million, have no father in their home. That's 300% higher than the global average. If you wanna have a father, America is one of the worst nations to be born in. That's why I wanna honor you men. You men are here because you want to be fathers, physical and spiritual fathers. Fatherless children account for 85% of behavioral disorders. And the majority of those, do you think it's the boys or the girls? It's the boys. Oh, he's rowdy and he's acting up. No, he's masculine. You don't need to castrate him, you need to direct him. Take all that strength and channel it for good. 75% of high school dropouts are fatherless. True or false, those are mainly sons, not daughters. True. And 63% of all suicides. Again, boys tend to be the majority. We have a world that is custom built to destroy masculinity and to kill boys at the earliest possible age. I just thought about it. I think it's from the Holy Spirit. Back in the ancient empire of Egypt, the Pharaoh tried to kill all the baby boys. In the days of Jesus, Herod tried to kill all the baby boys. Satan always works through the government to either abort or kill or then to confuse and to castrate the boys. And you're the men and you're the fathers and your job is to make sure that doesn't happen to your boys. Fatherless children have 200% higher mental illness, 400% higher poverty, 500% higher mood disorders, and 1,000 higher percent substance abuse. Here's what I'm telling you. You can't tax enough people. You can't arm enough police officers. You can't build enough jails. You can't hand out enough prescriptions for fatherless young men. The only hope for our culture, which is a disaster, the only hope for our nation, which is in decline, and the only hope for your legacy is better fathers. And as we have worse fathers, we have more government. And as I'm telling you, government doesn't even believe that there are men, let alone how to raise one. You can go to school, there's no class on how to be a man. You can go to college, you can't get a degree in masculinity, you can in femininity. You need a license to drive a car or a boat or hunt for a trout, but you don't need to take any class or certification to be a father. You can't even perform CPR without someone training you, but you can do whatever the heck you want with your child. I wanna honor you men for being here. What you're doing is some of the most important work in the history of the world. And I wanna say, for those of you men who have been good fathers, we need you to help train the rest. For those of you men that have had some mistakes as fathers, we want you to own that with your children and to heal that for generations. And for those of you young men who are here, we are so honored to have you. And if you wanna love Jesus and love your wife and raise your kids as sons and daughters, we just wanna say you're welcome here, amen?
let me close with this hot mess of a talk. Here's some time around the table. Uh, what were your father and grandfather like? What did the Holy Spirit highlight in the sermon for you? How well do you relate to God as father? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? How can we pray for you? Love you guys, I'll pray for you now. Father, thanks for an opportunity uh, to study. God, we thank you that of all the names you could have chosen, you chose father. You chose father. Jesus, of all the names you could have chosen, to speak most often of who our God is. You chose Father. When you taught us to pray, you taught us to pray to our Father. So Father, we thank you that, that we're your sons. We thank you that we're under your dominion and rule and authority. And we thank you that we get to share your name, Father. We thank you that we get to, we get to have sons and daughters and we get to be their Father and we get to teach them about our Father. And God, I pray that these men would be fantastic fathers. There's no such thing as a perfect father, but a humble father, a present father, a loving father. I pray that the little girls born in this church or to the men who are listening online, they would be held by their dad. They'd be snuggled with their dad. They would see their dad as a, a lion for them and a lamb with them. I pray there'd be daddy dates and there'd be tea parties and there'd be lots of giggles and snuggles and, and dad would be the center of the universe, the big man that they looked forward to being around because they were blessed by and safe with. I pray for the sons, Lord, that they would be encouraged and blessed, that their masculine strength wouldn't be castrated, but directed. God, that we wouldn't just allow this world to raise our children, especially our sons, that we wouldn't let them spend more time on the screen than out in fresh air, that we wouldn't just assume that godless government would know how to raise a young man. And Lord, I pray for the sons that are born and growing up. I honor the young men and the teenage men in the room and online. God, I pray for the young boys that are going to be young men soon. And God, I pray for the fathers in the room that we could love and lead well. And God, I pray from us would come hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. In Jesus' name, I ask for hundreds of thousands of strong, godly, spirit-filled men who follow Jesus and honor their father and love their wives and raise their kids to be sons and daughters who become men and women, who become husbands and fathers in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Thanks for letting me teach.